Hello everyone, it's Monday and you're watching Within the Frame where we delve deeper into the top stories not only in South Korea but across the globe. I'm Kim bo -kyung. Dubbed the Davos of Defense, the 59th Munich Security Conference came to an end on Sunday. Topping the agenda of the three-day conference was Russia's war in Ukraine, but that was not all. There was a lot to see, in fact, from U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken having face-to-face -face talks with China's top diplomat Wang Yi and the diplomats of three countries, South Korea, the U.S. and Japan, in a show of their ironclad alliance against North Korea's provocations. What were mainly discussed at the conference. What are hidden intentions of some phrases and words said by top diplomats? For an in-depth analysis of major issues that dominated the conference and those related to the East Asian region, we invite Dr. Kim yang principal researcher at East Asia Institute on the Line. Dr. Kim, welcome to the show. Thank you. All right, and we also have Dr. Patrick Cronin, Asia-Pacific Security Chair, Professor of Hudson Institute on the line as well. Dr. Cronin, welcome, and thank you for your making time. Glad to be here. All right, Dr. Cronin, first question to you. One of many issues that dominated the Munich Security Conference was, of course, the war in Ukraine. Foreign ministers of G7 nations reaffirmed their commitment to support Ukraine in its war against Russia. I mean, they pledged to beef up the economic sanctions against Moscow and agreed to hold Russia to account under international law. How can such promises be built upon? Well, just by showing unity as we enter year two of this awful war is very important. And I think the G7 ministers have done just that. They've shown that they are not tired of uh, trying to impose costs on aggression. And this has really hurt Russia's economy. Maybe not as much as some had forecast, but it is hurting. And the issue of sustainment, of how to sustain a war, uh, gets into economic issues, gets into technology. So it's very important for the G7 countries to continue to lead the world on this issue because it does constrain aggression by Russia. Right. Now, Dr. Kim, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky urged leaders to speed up the delivery of crucial military supplies. And he also added there would be no choice but for Ukraine to eventually join the EU and NATO. Can Western nations, in your opinion, speed up the delivery of military supplies? And what would the implications of Ukraine's membership of the EU and NATO be? Well, first of all, when it comes to a battle between David and Goliath, people tend to cheer for the weaker side. So, and this time, the even as democracy is at stake, so I believe Ukraine will continue to receive a considerable amount of lethal and non-lethal equipment from NATO members and other U.S. allies in the Pacific region, including South Korea, Japan, and Australia. However, I do not believe that the European countries will support for granting NATO membership to Ukraine anytime soon. NATO members have been supporting Ukraine since the outbreak of war, but they have not done three things so far. One, NATO allies have not imposed a no-fly zone. Two, they have provided long-range rocket launchers like HIMARS, but not the ammunition with the longest range. And three, many countries like the US, UK, and Germany pledged to send tanks, but no country promised to give fighter jets. All these points lead to one thing. No one wants a direct confrontation with the Russian army. But what would happen if Ukraine becomes a new NATO member? It would trigger Article 5 of the NATO Art Collective Defense Agreement and will cause all allies to get into much more direct and war against Russia. This will also fulfill Putin's prediction and give him a massive propaganda boost. I do not think there is a single country in NATO that wants this. So I believe President Zelensky will get more ammunition and tanks, and not the weapon system that can target and strike Russia's deep areas and the process of including Ukraine into NATO alliance would be able to start only after the termination of the war, I think. So there is high possibility that uh, the Ukraine would not be able to be granted with the NATO membership because it could boost up the propaganda used by Russia. Right, interesting. Now, Dr. Cronin, meanwhile, the U.S. Uh, showed concerns over Beijing's uh, deepening uh, relationship with Moscow. I mean, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has also uh, shown the concerns saying that and warning that the implications and consequences if China provides material support to Russia or assistance with systemic sanctions invasion. Now, what might China react to such comments and what could the Beijing government be thinking regarding the Ukrainian war right now? 
Well, I think we saw some immediate reaction out of Beijing that they were not happy with those kind of comments. Um, but that's too bad because it would be very troubling indeed to see China sort of tip its support to Russia into military uh, uh, sort of materiel. They've only been performative so far in terms of support for, for Russia. They've gone through the motions diplomatically. They've maybe provided some economic support and some imagery, uh, but mostly indirectly and mostly not through the government. I think if they start to, as Wang Yi is in Moscow now, um, make a deal to provide arms to, uh, to Russia's war effort here in year two, uh, this would be a sign of escalation and a very concerning sign for the U.S. But it may be that, uh, as Dr. Kim was suggesting, I mean, you know, the Chinese may want maneuvering room here for negotiation and for leverage. They say they may say NATO and U.S. If you increase your armament to support Ukraine, we're going to keep open our options to provide some uh, further support, maybe arms, uh, to Moscow. Right, interesting. Now, Dr. Kim, shifting gears a little bit here, on the sidelines of the conference, top diplomats of South Korea, Japan, and the U.S. strongly condemned North Korea's long-range ballistic missile launch and said their trilateral alliance would only deepen and solidify. Now, would this type of approach be effective in dealing with the, the reclusive regime? Well, if you're asking me whether there is strength in trilateral security cooperation would prevent Pyongyang from conducting more missile and nuclear provocations, my answer is no, unfortunately. North Korea launched two more SRBMs even today. I think it is ultimately at the hands of North Koreans. And Kim Jong-un has not much to give to its North Korean people, suffering from the devastating consequence of the strict border control since the outbreak of the pandemic. And his five-year economic plan that promised to increase DPRK GDP by seven percentage every year is brutally failing. So Pyongyang needs an excuse for more military provocation to demonstrate the Kim regime's achievement in weapons development to offset its failure on the economic front. While the U.S. has to provide assurance to its critical allies in the region, such as South Korea and Japan. So North Korea will do more provocations if there are any U.S. ROK or U.S. Japan joint military exercises in the region while Washington has to show its capability and resolve not only to Pyongyang, but also to Seoul and Tokyo to buttress the credibility of its extended deterrence in the region. So I strongly believe the spiral on the peninsula will continue to continue for some time. I do not think we can end this vicious circle until there is some major changes of policies from both sides. Ultimately, Pyongyang should change its position and strategic line of nuclear first and for all of us to break out of this circle. But to do so, Washington, Seoul, and Tokyo also need to find a way to help Kim Jong-un save face and signal that they are serious about providing a secure guarantee to the region. Right. So uh, apparently it's, uh, strengthening the trilateral alliance between all those three countries would not be able to prevent North's further provocations. Right. Now, Dr. Cronin, now South Korean Foreign Minister Park Jin said that Russia's attack on Ukraine and global attention on that war kind of emboldened North Korea in terms of provocations. What, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I think Foreign Minister Park is right. Uh, the idea that conflict in Europe, if it allows, uh, if it is allowed to succeed or show progress, could very well uh, lead to conflict in Asia, both on the Korean Peninsula or perhaps across the Taiwan Strait. Um, I think um, Kim Jong Un has found maneuvering room as well from the fact that there's war, that uh, the world's distracted, um, and that uh, Russia needs any support it can. So even from North Korea, so this gives Kim Jong Un a room to uh, create provocation to pursue his missiles as he's doing uh, rather rapidly. And I think, um, you know, the trilateral support of, of Korea, Japan, and the United States. Uh, it may not prevent further uh, missiles, but it, but it can definitely deter their use. And I think the strengthening of those three countries is the most important reaction to North Korea being emboldened by the war in Ukraine. Right. I see. Now, Dr. Kim, Park also added that if North Korea conducts a seventh nuclear test, it will be a game changer in the sense that North Korea could develop and deploy uh, tactical nuclear missiles. Now, how should South Korea prepare to tackle this? Well, I do not believe that conducting the seven nuclear tests itself is a game changer, and it will really depend on what they are testing. The previous six tests already show that North Korea possesses capability to build nuclear warheads. So the question is whether it really has the capability to miniature and mount them on the missiles or on their super large multiple launch rocket system. 
as Seoul's recently released the defense white paper says, and not only most experts, but also the South Korean government believe that the Pyongyang has the capability to detonate a miniaturized nuclear device. But Pyongyang can show off this capability with the seventh test. What makes it very dangerous for us is, to combi is the combination of this nuclear warhead and solid fuel missiles. The ICBM North Korea tested over the weekend was a liquid fuel missile. Even though it was a sudden launching drill, it took about nine hours for them to launch the missile after the written order from Kim Jong-un arrived. So this gives us ample time to respond. But solid fuel missile is a different. It theoretically, can be launched Im immediately after the order. So a game changer for the U.S. is when Pyongyang successfully develops a solid fuel ICBM with a nuclear warhead. But the game changer for the South Korea was in actually 2019, when North Korea successfully tested its KN-23 missile, a solid fuel short range ballistic missile. But it would be more, what, we can still intercept this as, as uh, SRBMs, but it would be very difficult and expensive because we need to build multi-layer missile defense system. So this is why Kim Yo-jong calls names and says Seoul is full and Pyongyang has no intention to stand up face to face with us because they believe they have the upper hand. I personally believe the kill chain is the way we should go to neutralize threat because we are talking about nuclear missile here and we cannot think about the scenario of getting the first round of attack and then respond. Of course, it would not be easy to have a reliable preemptive strike capability, but I have hope for Washington's new strategic concept of the integral deterrence and the capability it will bring into this defense system, which focus on the ability to track, understand, and respond to the target a lot faster than before. With this capability, we might be able to establish a deterrence posture that can deny the North Korean nuclear missile threats. Right, I see. I'd like to also tap on the relationship between the U.S. and China. Uh, Dr. Cronin, Anthony Blinken met with China's top, top diplomat with uh, Wang Yi on the sidelines of the conference, and there both counterparts made their positions quite clear. Blinken said the violation of U.S. airspace by China's uh, such uh, spy balloons must never occur again, while Wang Yi called Washington's reaction quite absurd. Now, what's behind the stern uh, statements? Well, neither uh, country can afford to back down from their position, um, quite frankly. For the United States to find a, a surveillance program to be really uh, unveiled, because the American people were not focused on the fact that the Chinese might have, through their military, a uh, airship surveillance program, and then that they would somehow uh, put those airships right over uh, an ICBM field in Montana, for instance. Whether that was intentional or not, that was an eye-opener for Americans. So. Uh, Secretary Blinken really is responding to the fact that America uh, is outraged by this and, and wants some kind of strong response, but it needs to be an intelligent response. Meanwhile, Wang Yi is not backing down at all on the cover story that they don't even have a surveillance program. That seems uh, far-fetched. He, he can clearly say that it was maybe an accident, uh, but it's harder to say they don't have a surveillance program because I think there'll be a full report out of the Pentagon here in the coming days that will reveal the technology that they found on that airship that was shot down on February 4th. The other three balloons, of course, maybe were an overreaction by the United States, so maybe he's right about that. Uh, but at the same time, that's almost immaterial because that was done after the fact that they found out there really was a surveillance airship flying over the United States. So it was an abundance of caution for air traffic, but also because they just didn't know whether it might be related to what China had already done. Right. Now, Dr. Cronin, one more question, too. I mean, they both showed stern reactions to this spy balloon saga, but both also showed efforts to maintain a cordial relationship. I mean, China said that it hopes for a pragmatic and positive approach from the U.S. toward China in order to work together. And Blinken also stressed that Washington does not want any conflict with China nor relations becoming a new Cold War. Now, what is the reason behind efforts from both countries to control and manage such risks? Well, the world's two largest economies cannot afford uh, to go to war. They'll lose all of the aspirations that they really hold dear. Um, we know that. Uh, the Chinese know that. Um, so it's a matter of getting back to diplomacy that was uh, put off uh, course by this surveillance balloon earlier in the month. Um, and I think this was a first step toward doing that. So, yes, um, the U.S. has drawn a bright line saying, look, we don't want surveillance airships over our airspace. Get the, get the message. And China's saying, um, move on, America. Let's go on to the next, next issue. Um, and I think that's fine. Uh, we need to uh, make sure there are lines of communication and crisis communication channels open so that we do not see this kind of uh, misunderstanding um, blow up in Asia.
Right, so we need to uh, use diplomacy because our words are very interdependent to each other. Now, shifting gears a little bit here again. Now, Dr. Kim, we cannot leave out the wartime labor issue that was discussed between Seoul's Foreign Minister Park Jin and his Japanese counterpart Yoshimasa Hayashi. Now, for our viewers who might not be familiar with the issue, could you elaborate on how the issue has developed so far? Okay, um, to cut the long story short, the turmoil between the two countries united in 2018 when South Korean Supreme Court ordered Japanese firms to compensate their forced laborers during the colonial period. Japanese government strongly opposed, of course, the ruling, saying that all the issues related to the colonial era were completely and finally settled under a bilateral treaty signed in 1965. As Japanese firms refused to pay reparations to the former forced laborers, the court ordered the encashment of the Japanese company's assets, while the previous Moon government argued that this was an action under the judiciary final uh, ruling, so it must be respected. But the Abe administration criticized that the Korean side is not respecting official agreements between the two countries. Then there was a trade war between the two countries, a serious deterioration of the bilateral relations, even almost to reach, reach to the point where the, the uh, South Korea threatening terminating Chisomia and so on. So now the current Yun government tried to resolve the issue by creating a foundation based in South Korea to compensate the victims who won lawsuit against two Japanese firms. But the victims do not like the idea and argue that it is totally humiliating absurd that the Korean side pays the reparation without the direct involvement of the accused companies. So they argue that what they really need, what they really want is a sincere apology from the Japanese side. So for the Korean side, it is essential to come up with a measure that could involve the accused Japanese companies in the compensation process. Right. Since our Dr. Kim kindly explained uh, how this issue has been developed so far, Dr. Cronin, I'd like to uh, tap on the discussion that was made at the conference. Now, the two sides eventually agreed to maintain close communication to resolve the issue. And Park has reportedly asked the Japanese side to make a political decision for a sincere response. What do you believe Japan's response will be? Well, I wish they could resolve this, uh, but uh, this is a tough, tough issue. Um, both the Yoon and the Kishida administrations are in a tough spot uh, trying to explain this to their political uh, sort of colleagues and to the society. Um, so I think uh, for Prime Minister Kishida, um, it's to continue this dialogue, to continue the Hayashi Park uh, uh, sort of communications, because it is making, it, at least managing this issue forward. Um, and I think uh, there can be... Um, essentially finesse, uh, a diplomatic finesse out of Tokyo, out of the Kishida government that basically puts a square into a, a round hole. That is to say, okay, we said it was all settled back in 1965, but clearly it's not all settled in democratic Korea right now. There's still a pain being felt today. So we're going to go the extra length. We're going to make a political judgment and go as far as we can. But, you know, Seoul needs to understand that you don't want Prime Minister Kishida to get so far ahead that this actually becomes a backlash against the settlement. So we have to both uh, work on this together in terms of Seoul and Tokyo uh, hand in hand on, on a settlement. Right, so we'll have to see. Now, Dr. Kim, would resolving the wartime labor issue provide a strong foundation for improving soured bilateral relations? And what should both countries consider the most when dealing with the wartime labor issue for it to be properly solved? Well, the one thing I want to emphasize is that all these strategic documents uh, released last year, the U.S. strategic documents, emphasize that U.S. the main uh, strategic concept for U.S. future defense strategy is integrated deterrence. And that is is effort to try to establish a security framework that can connect the capability of U.S. allies integrating into all aspects of U.S. national capabilities and build a network-based deterrent posture that can address systematic and immediate challenges coming from Beijing and Moscow. The Seoul Washington Tokyo Trilateral Security Partnership is one of the key elements in this integrated deterrent system. So, given the increasing nuclear and missile threats from Pyongyang, as we just explained today, and intensifying economic and political coercion from Beijing, I think it is almost inevitable for South Korea and Japan to strengthen their bilateral cooperation. So, I believe the relation will be improved rapidly once they manage to settle down the historic issue. So, this is really a key problem for both countries' future.
Right. I really hope this issue could be properly solved in a way the victims and family members could also agree on, and also in a way it could provide strong foundation for both countries to, you know, improve their bilateral relationship. Now, uh, Dr. Cronin, last question for you. Now, how would you evaluate the outcome of the Munich Security Conference this year in terms of the Asia Pacific region? Were discussions fruitful? Well, discussions were very important. I don't know whether they were fruitful or not. We'll see. Um, I, I mean, I do think they underscored the unity uh, of the transatlantic relations uh, and of the in, of allies and partners in Asia in support of uh, Ukraine's effort to, for self-defense. That is, they did not ask for this war a year ago, but it came to Ukraine. Uh, they're suffering immensely, and, and yet the world is not tiring from supporting uh, their ability to stand up to aggression. Aggression must not succeed in Europe. It will be followed with aggression elsewhere, possibly in Asia. Um, and yet, at the same time, the Munich Security Conference also highlighted the fact that peace must follow. And that doesn't mean a frozen conflict. It doesn't mean something that will be a fake peace. But eventually, we're going to have to come to a diplomatic settlement. So I think both the unity and support for Ukraine's self-defense effort was real. And secondly, the, the real search for finding off ramps for peace is going to continue to be a big issue. And I think the Munich Security Conference helped to highlight that. Right. So the conference was fruitful in a way that emphasized peace and what was it, unity. All right, Dr. Cronin. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today's edition. But thank you, Dr. Kim and Dr. Cronin, for helping our viewers better understand the major issues discussed during the conference. We really appreciate the insight. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you. All right, that's all for Within the Frame tonight. We will be back tomorrow with more in-depth stories. Thank you for watching and goodbye.